Our Father, we thank you because of the burden you have placed upon our hearts that these ministers could be together. Lord, we thank you for their receptivity, for their openness. Lord, as we just look through the days in which we have been meeting, how wonderful that general overseers and general superintendents and pastors and district overseers and leaders from these various churches can come together in such a large number and be exposed to the fact that Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus sanctifies, Jesus delivers, and Jesus baptizes in the Holy Ghost. Lord, we're grateful to you that you could give them such a heart to receive, to fellowship, and to share. And Lord, we pray that the things that are planted in their hearts this week will never leave them. But it will be a fruit. Fruit in their churches and fruit in their lives and fruit in their families in Jesus' name. Continue to bless them. And Father, we pray that in this church, as you have blessed us tremendously with literature, with cassettes, with finance, with things that the Lord that you have been providing for the growth in this church. Lord, I pray that you'll provide for all these ministers as well in Jesus' name. That the great work you have given them to do, this work will prosper in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that as we have future conferences, that you will lead us into greater dimension of your own perfect will as to how to carry on this sharing and fellowship and teaching and training for pastors and ministers from all these assemblies and denominations. Lord, broaden our hearts. Give us greater love. Give us more understanding. Help us to reach out to be a blessing to these ministers from all over the nation. And Lord, if you can even extend our hand of love and outreach and training to pastors and ministers of denominations and churches all over Africa, O oh Lord, thy will be done. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to help other people. Father, I pray, as these days have been heavy for me and for the state overseers of deeper life, I pray, Lord, that in this church you'll raise up other people, men of God, women of God, that we all together will be able to join hands together as members and workers and ministers in this church to be a blessing to this continent of Africa. Lord, raise up giants in this church that can teach, that can pray, that can counsel, that can evangelize, that will be missionaries for the glory of your name, that will bring revival fires, not only in deeper life, but in many churches in Nigeria and Africa. Do it for us, O Lord. Let your mighty hand be upon every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. This month, the Spirit of the Lord has led us to have this seminar on prayer and faith. And the Lord is leading us into great heights and depths and breadths and lengths on the subject of prayer and faith. And I told you before, and I want to tell you again, that this is, a, is one of the greatest secrets of the kingdom of God ever revealed or made known to redeemed men. Many people pray, but only few pray the prayer of faith. And that's the subject of this afternoon's worship. The prayer of faith. What's the prayer of faith? That's the type of prayer that always gets an answer. And it is only possible to pray this type of prayer if you know the will of God on a subject you are praying about. To pray the prayer of faith, I must know the promise of God concerning the problem. And I must pray to God to do what He said He will do. And believe him to do as he said he will do. Listen to me. If you want your prayer to be answered every time you pray, there is only one thing you need to check up. Find out what God said before he will do. Find it out. That's what Abraham did. He found out what God said he will do. He went to God. He reminded him, 
do what you said you will do. That's what Moses did. I will raise up families and children out of Abraham. He found out what God said he will do. He went to God and reminded him, do what you said you will do. That's what Joshua did. He found out that God had willed an inheritance of the land of, of promise unto the children of Israel. And he went back to God and reminded God uh, to do what he said he will do. That's what David did. He remembered the covenant that was given unto David. The Davidic covenant. And he went back to God and reminded him, do what you said you will do. That's what Daniel did. That the children of Israel, they were in the land of captivity. And 70 years were accomplished. And he found out from the prophecy of Jeremiah that you said after 70 years, you are going to return the people from Babylon and they'll go back to their land. And he reminded God, do what you said you will do. That is what the apostles did. They remember the promises of Jesus Christ. And they went to God and said, do what you said you will do. Before you can pray the prayer of faith, all you need to do is find out what God said he will do before. Then go to God and remind him, O oh Lord, do what you said you will do. Second Samuel chapter 7. Look at it. Pray in the prayer of faith. This is all it demands. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 25. Now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. Brothers and sisters, if I am ignorant of what God said concerning me, concerning my house, concerning my ministry, concerning the church, I cannot pray the prayer of faith. Brothers and sisters, if you are ignorant of the promise of the Lord, of the word of the Lord concerning you, concerning your wife, concerning your husband, concerning your family, concerning your ministry, concerning our church, if you are ignorant on what God said he will do, you will not be able to pray the prayer of faith. How do I pray the prayer of faith? Find out what God said before that he will do. Then go to him and remind him, Now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant, concerning me, concerning his house, concerning my house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27. And in verse 25, Paul the Apostle, how could he pray the prayer of faith? Oh, well, he knew what the Lord said they will do. And he took God up on that note, on that challenge. Do what you said you will do. And he now gave a testimony. He said, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be, even as it was told me. That's how to pray the prayer of faith. Find out what God said he will do, and then remind him to do it. And then believe him to do as he said he will do. The man or the woman who prays the prayer of faith, prays with assurance and certainty, in fact, the spirit of truth will impress and inspire and interpret the promise of God in his heart. And then standing on those promises, impressed, inspired, interpreted into his heart, then he's able to pray the prayer of faith without doubting and without wavering. So, we can learn how to pray the prayer of faith. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you on four points under the prayer of faith. Number one, perspectives on faith. What is faith? Perspectives on faith. Number two, the possibilities of faith. I love that. I love that. In fact, I'll tell you this privately. I have a notebook that I write on, it's personal to me, on the possibilities of faith. 
All that God reveals to me as I study the Bible on prayer and I study the Bible on faith just for myself. And I keep that notebook and I begin to, and I just add onto it, add onto it, add onto it. The possibilities of faith. And I advise you to do the same. Every time you read the Bible and you see that he divided the Red Sea, write it down. That's a possibility of faith. You read the Bible and you saw that Peter walked on the water, write it down. That's a possibility of faith. And, and you, you see in the Bible that when Joshua looked up and he said, the sun should stand still in that place. Write it down as another possibility of faith. And you see the leper, you, you see the leper being touched, and then the leprosy is cleansed. That's a possibility of faith. And I want to discuss with you that this afternoon, what are the possibilities of faith? If I have this faith that we're talking about, the real faith, the Bible faith, the living faith, the working faith, the precious faith, what are the possibilities? Number three, petitions of the faithful. Petitions of the faithful. That is, what do I ask from God when I pray? What do I tell God to do for me? And I say, God, I need this, I need this, I need this. What are those things? Then number four, the people of faith. The people of faith. Only it's not possible to have a seminar like this and just go on and on and on until we exhaust everything from the Bible. You know, if I had my way, if I could, if I could possibly do it and just talk for you today alone on the perspectives of faith. And then you come back next Sunday and I talk to you all alone on the possibilities of faith. You come back another Sunday, I talk on the petitions of the faithful. And I have a whole Sunday to myself to talk on the people of faith. Oh, it would have been wonderful. But all the same, today, if we can just get into the shore and then leave you to launch into the deep of the prayer of faith, the perspectives, the possibilities, the petitions, and the people of faith. Number one, the perspectives of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. What is faith? How do I know when I have faith? What's the thermometer that I can use to measure whether the faith is right, rising or going down? What is faith? In Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the reality of things hoped for, the image of things hoped for, and the evidence, the manifestation of things not seen. And in verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Brothers and sisters, what's faith? Somebody says, I believe in the existence of God. But is that all? No. There is much more to faith. Remember, Satan believes and he trembles. Sinners believe and they're still in their sins. They believe in the existence of God. Somebody else says, I believe Jesus came to this world and he died on the cross. That's right. But there is more to faith. He did not only die on the cross, he rose on the third day. Another person says, I believe he died for sinners. Oh yes, that's right. But much more, he died for me. Somebody else says, I believe, I have faith that his word must control my life. Much more, his blood must cleanse my heart. What is faith? Follow me. Number one, faith is believing that God will do what he says he will do, whatever the surrounding circumstances. Faith. Think about Abraham. Think about the surrounding circumstances. He believed that God will do what he said he will do, no matter the circumstances. Think about Moses before Pharaoh. Think about Moses in Egypt. Think about Moses leading the children of Israel in the wilderness. What is faith? He believed that God will do what he says he will do, whatever the surrounding circumstances. Think of Elijah by the brook Cherith. 
with no wife there, no child there, no friend there, no servant there, nobody to bring him food there. But he believed God will do what he says he will do, whatever the surrounding circumstances. And when the river dried up, he had faith. What is faith? Faith is believing that God will do what he says he will do, whatever the surrounding circumstances. And when you have that faith in you, that whatever your circumstances, whatever the situation in the family, whatever the handicap surrounding you, you believe that God will do what he says he will do. My brother, my sister, that is faith. I read it to you already. When Paul the Apostle, with the storm raging, with the boat or the ship being tossed to and fro, with the heavens being darkened, and with all the unbelievers in the place casting all their wares, all their property into the river, he said, Sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. It shall be, even as it was told me. What is faith? Number one, it is believing that God will do what he says he will do, whatever the surrounding circumstances. Number two, faith is counting it done. Before I see the manifestation, because... God cannot lie. Faith is counting it down. Before I see the manifestation. Because God cannot lie. Listen to me. God came to Abraham in the company of two angels. And Abraham received him. Received the company. And then made a little kid, one of the goats, and then prepared something for them. And before they left, they said, Abraham, call your, call your wife, Sarah. And when the wife came, the Lord said, by this time next year, you know that means one year, by this time next year, you will carry that baby. That means then, if the woman is to be pregnant for nine months, she wasn't pregnant immediately. Because by this time next year, that is one year. That means there will be three months before the pregnancy. And then nine months of the pregnancy, then you are by this time next year. Within those three months, faith is counting it down before I see the manifestation. Because God cannot lie. He said so. He will do it. I have not seen it. But even though the manifestation is not there yet, he said, this time next year, this very time next year, this very time next year, because of that I know that even though these three months are there for me to wait, these three months are there for me to just stand in the faith, I know that it will be done. Faith is counting it done. Before I see the manifestation, because God cannot lie. Therefore, I call those things which be not as though they were. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And in verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before whom he believed, even God who quickness the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. That's faith. And in verse 19, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Number three, what is faith? Faith is the belief in the sufficiency of God's word to solve all my problems. Faith is the belief in the sufficiency of God's word to solve all my problems. Spiritual problems, physical problems, personal, um, personal problems. Family problems, financial problems, every problem. Faith is the belief in the sufficiency of God's word. What did the centurion say in Matthew chapter 8, verses 8 to 13? Speak the word only. That's faith. 
Believe in the sufficiency of God's word to solve all my problems. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Speak the word only and my mountain shall be removed. Speak the word only and the demon will be cast out. Speak the word only and the oppression shall cease. Speak the word only and the provision shall come. Speak the word only and the sorrow and the sadness and the shame and the reproach shall flee away. Speak the word only and all my problems are solved. What is faith? Believe in the sufficiency of God's word to solve all my problems. Number four, what is faith? Faith is complete trust and unshakable confidence in Christ's ability and God's power to do the impossible in my life. Faith is the complete trust. Complete trust. Unshakable confidence in Christ's ability and God's power to do the impossible in my life. Picture Mary and Martha wanting to meet Jesus Christ. Their brother Lazarus had died, but Jesus was coming. You know what Martha said? Martha said, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother will not have died. But even now, even now, I know that whatsoever you will ask from God, he will do it. What is that? Faith. That complete trust, unshakable confidence in Christ's ability and God's power to do the impossible in my life and in my family. In Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And I'm reading from verse 27. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus says unto them, Believe ye that I'm able to do this? Believe ye that I'm able to do this? Do you have unshakable confidence, absolute, complete trust in my ability and God's power to do this impossible thing? And they answered and said, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open. What is faith? Number five. Faith is the blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. You sing it. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. That's faith. Faith is the blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. And all things that come through Jesus Christ, they are mine. What does that mean? All the promises of God, even heaven, and the inheritance of the saints, everything that comes through Calvary, they are mine because Jesus is mine. That is faith. And that means that they are mine now and they are mine forever. They are mine whenever I need them. They are mine whenever I call, whenever I claim them. That is faith. In John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name. You see that? Because Jesus is mine, his name is mine. Because his name is mine, all that that name stands for will be mine. Because all that is mine, whatever I ask in that name, it is given to me. What is faith? What is faith? Faith is a blessed assurance that Jesus is mine, heaven is mine, the promises are mine, the benefits of the covenant are mine, all things purchased by Christ through his blood on the cross of Calvary, they are mine, mine now, mine forever, mine whenever I need them, mine whenever I call or claim them. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if ye shall ask anything. If ye shall ask anything, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it because it's yours. So then, the perspectives on faith, that's what faith is. Believing that God will do what he says he will do. Whatever circumstances may surround me, counting it done, the moment I pray, before I even see the manifestation, because I know after all, God cannot lie. And so I can call those things which be not as do the world. Believing that God's word is sufficient to solve all my problems, whatever those problems are, personal, spiritual, physical, 
psychological, family, whatever it is. And having complete trust, unshakable confidence in Christ's ability, God's power to do the impossible in my life. And what a blessed assurance lies within me when I know Jesus is mine. All that comes through him, they belong to me as well. Now, the possibilities of faith. What are the possibilities of faith? In short, all things. All things. They are possible through faith. In Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Verse 22. All things, I told you. All things. Whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. I love that passage. All things, all things. All I need is to desire it. All I need is to believe when I pray. All I need to do is just to go to God in prayer and say, Lord, you said all things and you said whatsoever, and now I come. And all things are possible when I pray like that. All things whatsoever ye shall ask, believing ye shall receive. In fact, we're told in John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. But we're now going to do some study of the word on the possibilities of faith. I, I, I never saw this before, but just a few weeks ago, and I told you before that, the Lord has been revealing some things to me concerning faith. Just some weeks ago, a few months ago, that the Lord revealed these scriptures to me. And comparing them, I see that the possibilities of faith, they are very, very great. They are very, very great. It's good that you have the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit that takes the Word of God, interprets it to your heart and says, there is it and it is for you. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. And at the same time, you'll compare that verse with Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Mark 9, Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God. All things are possible. Those four words, never forget them. All things are possible with God. But come to Mark chapter 9 verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, that means if you can only believe, all things are possible. The same four words are possible to him that believeth. Used for God all things are possible for God. That's easy for you to believe. Because he sits on the throne of heaven. He sits on the whole throne of the whole universe. He's the captain, he's the leader, he's the creator, he's the all-sufficient one. And he is in the midst of all the angels and they are worshipping him. And there is nothing impossible for him. All things are possible with God. But when you use the same words, the same words, the same words, all things are possible to him that believeth. That's another thing. The great possibilities of faith. Now, there are two ways of saying that something can be done. Two ways of saying that something can be done. Finalizing it, that something can be done. Convincing everybody that something can be done. Only two ways. What are those two ways? Number one. All things are possible. That's positive. Nothing shall be impossible. That's another way of saying the same thing. And when you say it both ways, when you say all things are possible and nothing shall be impossible, that means that thing is finalized, is concluded, that it will be absolutely done. And look at it. With God, all things are possible. With the believing man, all things are possible. Let me show you the other side. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. With Luke chapter 1. We're comparing both verses. Look at Luke chapter 1. Verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. You see that? With God, all things are possible. With God, nothing shall be impossible. That makes it concrete. That makes it absolute. That makes it very clear. With God, nothing shall be impossible. 
Look at Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20. And Jesus says unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. Look at this, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. You see that? With God, all things are possible. With the believing man, all things are possible. With God, nothing shall be impossible. With the believing man, nothing shall be impossible. The same statements that are said about God, said about the man who will believe. Who can believe? That means the possibilities of faith are very great. Now come to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And at the same time, put your finger in, in John chapter 16. John 11, verses 21 and 22. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask, for what? Whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Whatsoever thou wilt ask, whatsoever ye shall ask, whatsoever you will ask. Just the same four words. Used for Jesus, the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah, the one that was filled with the supernatural power of God. And he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Come to John chapter 16 and verse 23 and look at the same four words. John 16 verse 23 And in that day ye shall ask me nothing Verily, verily I say unto you Notice this Whatsoever ye shall ask Whatsoever ye shall ask The Father in my name He will give it you What does the Bible say? Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses The truth shall be confirmed One All things are possible with God and the believing man Two Nothing shall be impossible with God and the believing man. Three, whatsoever ye shall ask, apply to Christ, apply to the believing man. All things are possible if you only believe. That means then, that the possibilities of faith, they are very, very great. Very, very great. Great are these possibilities of faith. It can save the soul. Faith can secure a place for you in heaven. Faith can sanctify and make the believer holy. Faith can heal the sick. Faith can deliver the oppressed. Faith can endue you with the Spirit's power. Faith can cast out devils. Faith can move mountains. Faith can calm the storm. Faith can raise the dead. Faith can supply all your needs. Faith can provide you all your heart's desires. In short, faith can repeat Christ's ministry on earth right now. Faith. It can duplicate the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth right now. Faith can produce everything that Jesus could produce and do when he was on the face of the earth. Yes, great are the possibilities of faith. Now, no time. But, number three. The petitions of the faithful. Petitions of the faithful. We're told that Abraham was called the faithful, the faithful one. In Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, and in verse 9, So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. They which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Well, you are called a faithful one if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the seed of Abraham. What are the petitions you can bring to God? The petitions of the faithful. Now what will I do? To go from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible and tell you all the petitions that the characters in the Bible, the personalities in the Bible brought to God in prayer and God answered? There are so many, but group them under seven headings. Number one. God will give you in prayer if you make petition for whatsoever is needed. All the petitions you have in the Bible, 
they needed one thing or the other. What can I pray for? I can ask for whatsoever I need. Number two, whatsoever I desire. Whatsoever you desire when you pray. The desire of the righteous. The Lord says he will fulfill the desires of his saints. Number one, I can ask for whatever is needed. Number two, I can ask for whatever is desired. Number three, I can ask for whatever is promised. And the promises of God, they cover every area of the need of man's life. Social, spiritual, psychological, physical, material, financial, family, any type of problem, temporal, eternal, whatever it is. I can ask for whatever I need. Number two, whatever I desire. Number three, whatever is promised. Number four, whatever is spiritually and eternally profitable. Salvation comes into that. Spiritually and eternally profitable. Sanctification, spiritually and eternally profitable. Godliness is profitable in the life that now is and in the world to come. Whatever you check up. And say, this thing I'm asking from God, is it profitable, eternally, and spiritually? Number five, whatever is legitimately demanded by your dependents. Jesus told the parable of a friend that had a friend that came to him. And that friend demanded food. And he had, she had no food. And went to the friend and knocked on the door. Give me loaves of bread because there's a demand at home. It wasn't for ourselves, it wasn't for himself, it was for the visitor. And we can go to God and ask whatever is legitimately demanded by dependence. Number six, whatever will contribute to our fullness of joy in the Lord. I want that thing because it will make me happy in the Lord, joyful in the Lord. It will make me, it will make my joy to be full. Number seven, whatsoever will assist us in the fulfillment of the ultimate goal set for us by God. And think about all the things that the patriarchs, the prophets, the people of old that they asked for. They fitted into these seven categories. And all those things were needed, or desired, or promised, or profitable, or demanded, or it contributed to the fullness of their joy, or it assisted them in the fulfillment of the goals set before them by God. Now, the people of faith. The people of faith. I want you to write down Joshua chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 16. Because we don't have time to read that now. Joshua chapter 6 verses 1 to 16. And Judges chapter 7 verse 7 verse 9 verses 15 to 22. And Second Chronicles chapter 1 chapter 20 verse 1 verse 4 verses 14 to 22. And verse 29. The people of faith. Why have I given you these three references? Listen. In the history of the children of Israel, these were three definite specific times when all the people involved, every one of them, they believed God for what they were asking for. It was a unity of faith. Think about Joshua, the priests, the people, going around Jericho once a day for six days and seven, days on the, seven times on the last day. They all believed in the unity of faith that we refer to them at that time, for that moment, for that purpose, in the exercise of their faith for that problem. They were the people of faith. Think of Gideon and all the 300 with him. Only 300 and the enemies numbered into thousands. But all the 300, without an exception, all the 300, they believed God in the unity of faith. At that time, they were the, they were the people of faith. Think of Jehoshaphat and Judah and, and uh, Jerusalem. All together, they sought the face of the Lord. And then the Lord spoke by a prophet, by a man of God, that this battle is not yours, it belongs to the other. Everybody connected with that problem, everybody believed, and they were the people of faith. Come back to Joshua, and let's speak just that case. Joshua had faith in God. He believed God implicitly, without a shadow of doubt. The priests, 
Those were the next category of leaders. They believed God's word in Joshua's mouth. And then there was faith in the people, all the people. They followed confidently. They were sure of the final victory. Then there was faith without doubting throughout the seven days in all the camp. There was faith without wavering in the young and in the old. No one ever thought of defeat, not for a moment. And the women, all, all of the women, they had faith in God at that time for that problem. There was no comment of unbelief expressed to their husbands in the camp. No fear entertained in any family. All of them together, they were the people of faith. What happened? The walls came down flat. And if such a faith that is in the pastor will be in all the preachers, will be in all the coordinators, will be in all the zonal leaders, will be in all the area leaders, will be in all the workers, will be in all the members, and for once in our life, for once in our church, from now on till we see Jesus face to face, we become the people of faith and we believe God to the letter that he will do what he said he will do. We'll see the supernatural above what we have ever seen in the church. Now let me ask you, what will happen? If all of us, the pastor, the preachers, the ministers, the zona leaders, the coordinators, everyone, the workers, the members, if all of us, the people in this church, men and women, if we manifested lively, dynamic, overcoming faith, what will happen? Number one, there will be no one feeble among us. That's what Psalm 105 verse 37 says. No one feeble among us. Number two, no man shall be able to stand before us in any state, in any city, in any village. That's Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. Number 3. None of us shall lack any good thing. In Luke chapter 22 verse 35, Jesus asked his disciples and he said, When I sent you out with no pause but with faith, when I sent you out with no script but with faith in your heart, did you lack anything? And he said, Nothing. And if we will become the people of faith, none of us shall lack any good thing. What will happen? If we became the people of faith. Number four, the church shall do exploits in every place in this generation. Daniel 11, 32. Number five, the days of Christ at his first coming will be repeated again before his return. A look will heal the sick. A touch will cleanse the leper. A word will drive out the devil. An handkerchief will deliver the oppressed. A shadow will heal the most chronic and deadly of all diseases and cast out powerful demons. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 12. That if we all became the people of faith, that we will see the days of Christ come back again. Now, if we became the people of faith, as I'm talking about, what will happen? Pharaohs will tremble again. Nebuchadnezzar will be astonished. Heralds of today will fear, and councils of today will wonder in amazement, and sinners will be saved in multitudes, and saints will be revived with a perpetual Pentecostal fire burning in every heart. As I said in Isaiah chapter 8 verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom you have given me were for wonders and signs in Israel. What will happen? If we all became the people of faith, this place, this site, this church will become an upper room. Lagos will become like Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And once again, we will, we will experience the year of Jubilee. And a decade of release will begin for the people of God. Suppose in this church, I can have somebody that will consecrate himself to the Lord. Maybe in this hall here, I'll be a Moses Another, another Moses. With the same faith that God planted in the heart of Moses, I'll move, I will act with that faith. And I have in that hall another one that will rise up and say, I dedicate myself, I want God to make me like another Joshua. And I have in that other place another one that will say, I want God to make me like another Samuel. And in that place, somebody to rise up and say, I want God to increase my faith and make me like another Elijah today. And in, on, this side of, on this side of mine, another one to rise up and say, I will be like Elijah with the double portion. And over there for another person to rise up, I'll be like Peter, I will be like Paul. And we have them all in this church, in this church alone. And if we have 1,000 people in this service alone, 
that will have the great faith, the strong faith, the living faith, the dynamic faith, the overcoming faith, the seed faith, the growing faith in us. And we say now we're going to dedicate ourselves until the Lord will saturate our hearts with his promises. And the Lord will develop in us a great, great, great faith. What do you think will happen? We'll move the hand of God like Moses moved the hand of God. We'll move the hand of God like Joshua, like, like David, like Daniel, like Elijah, like Elijah. Move the hand of God. And I'm asking you today, who is willing to consecrate himself to the Lord? And we'll say, oh Lord, use me in prayer like you used Moses. Use me in prayer like you used uh, Joshua. Use me in prayer and in the supernatural like you used Elijah and Elijah. Oh Lord, use me like you used Daniel as he stood upon the promises of God. And the whole nation was delivered from captivity from Babylon. God can do it again. And if we we'll rise up in faith and say, Lord, plant this faith in us, we'll conquer Africa for Christ. Let's rise up and tell the Lord that we consecrate ourselves. We consecrate ourselves. We're going to discover the faith in the Word of God. The faith in the Word of God. That God will plant it in us, exercise it through us, that mighty sins will be done. The supernatural will become common in this church more than ever before. Let's become the people of faith. The people of faith. And if you are not saved, or if you are not in this church yet, come and join the people of faith. The people before whom Pharaoh will tremble. The people before whom Nebuchadnezzar will be astonished. The people before whom Herod will fear and councils will wonder in amazement. Talk to the Lord. Oh Lord, make me, make me, make me, make me a person of faith. A person of faith. Plant the faith in me. Plant the faith in me. Plant the faith in me. God can do it again. Like Joshua. Have power like Elijah. Have the double portion like Elijah. God can do it again. Let's become the people of faith. The people of faith. 